now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to our webinar on how to avoid backing blunders in your business. My name is Alice Wolf, and I'm the manager of education for Madeira USA. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar. Um, our approach to this one was a little different from others. Uh, we decided that instead of just thinking up what you might need to know, uh, we decided to solicit questions from our customers and then um, give them to Nancy Minnie, who's our backing expert. We did a random mailing a few weeks ago, and when we received enough questions and concerns to fill an hour, we built the content of this webinar on the questions that we received. Some questions showed up more than once, as you can imagine, so you may recognize your topic, if not the exact wording of your question. Uh, we'd like to thank, actually, those customers who did take the time to share with us those projects that were, that were kind of fighting back. Uh, Nancy did reach out to those, those people who responded those weeks uh, back so that she could help them right away rather than waiting um, these weeks till today to come up with a response to their concerns. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone that we are recording the webinar. So if you're called away, um, you can always uh, see it again at your convenience. We will make a print version of our slides, um, questions and answers, and um, printable version and handouts all available to you, and we'll be sending you a, a link to reach all of those things. Um, let's take a look, next slide, to the, some of the questions that came in. We put them together. Um, as I mentioned, looked for duplicates and came up with topics that we could address, that Nancy could go into more details, which she will on each of these topics. Um, some people were asking fairly basic questions. Uh, what do I use for which fabric? Does the fabric have an effect on which stabilizer to use? How do I know, based on the design, if it's time to, to add stabilizer? Um, some wanted to know what, if anything, is new on the market. Um, some wanted to know if there was a kind of a shortcut, a go-to backing, where if they were totally confused, they could go to the to the go-to backing that um, others felt was um, a safe bet. Uh, Stick on pre presented uh, quite a few questions as well: when to use it, how to use it, how to prevent it from gumming up needles. So Nancy will go into detail about that. Um, embroidering on performance wear brought a lot of questions how to stop it from puckering. Um, if the design starts looking like a potato chip, um, something that, a, a reference that I hadn't heard before, but when you see the pictures that she'll be sharing with you, you'll know exactly um, about the potato chip and how you can avoid it. And also, um, some questions came in on dress shirts. These would be the, uh, the Oxford cloth or the chambray. Uh, dress shirt, um, is that considered a light or a heavyweight fabric, and how do you go about um, choosing uh, a stabilizer for that? So I'm going to turn this over to the next slide, which is going to show some of the questions um, and Nancy's first first talk. Nancy. Thank you, Alice, and welcome, everybody, and thank you very much for um, all the questions that you did send in. It's going to make for a great webinar, I think. And um, we are just going to go back to the basics just for a little bit, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, um, because people did ask, you know, what do I use for what? Is there a go-to backing? And, you know, what are the maximum number of stitches? Um, so that's what we're going to kind of cover first. And we have a poll coming up very shortly um, in our hopes to find out what your go-to backing is, because, you know, we can tell you as a supplier what we sell a lot of, but it's, I think it'll be interesting for everybody to share and we will reveal the results of that as well. Um, so when it comes to choosing a cutaway backing versus a tearaway backing, it really, really boils down to the fabric that you're embroidering on. And that's what's going to determine whether you use a cutaway or a tearaway. Um, so your cutaway stabilizers are for your non-stable fabrics. And we have a couple listed there. Um, so if it's a knit fabric or that one strand that's intertwining in itself, um, think about that as, you know, like a knit sweater, a knit uh, blanket or whatnot. That's a, uh, one single strand that's intertwined. And if you were to cut one of those, you'll actually have a hole in it. Um, very stretchy. It can stretch in all directions, um, so it's not stable. Then you have your lightweight 
fabrics, um, with, um, sorry, your lightweight woven fabrics, and those are your dress shirts, your oxfords, um, or any of the lightweight um, garments that are out there. While they're not, typically not stretchy, they're only somewhat stable. Um, so use your cutaway stabilizers for those fabrics to add more stability. Uh, when it comes to your tightly woven fabrics, you want to think about your denims, your canvas, um, corduroy, and things like that that have minimal stretch and they're very heavy. And technically, they don't even need a stabilizer um, to, to support the design, but you need that stabilizer when you're embroidering. Um, so how do the fabrics affect the choice of it? Well, we learned up above what is considered a lightweight um, or knit fabric versus that heavy knit, I'm sorry, the heavy woven fabrics. Um, so we just have some examples of fabrics here. On the very left, um, still um, relevant within the embroidery industry are those piquet golf shirts. Um, those are knits. You got your performance wear. Those are knits as well. Um, but then you have lightweight fabrics like your silks. Even though it's a woven fabric, it's lightweight, so it's not very stable. Um, Quarterage, you get a little more stable. And, of course, you have your light woven dress shirts. Um, and then you have your heavy-duty canvas and denim. Um, the terry cloth robe or the velour robe that you see over on the right-hand side, it's a pretty stable fabric, but that has its own challenges on its own. <clears throat> Um, so at this point, what we want to do is we want to launch our poll. Um, so um, people did ask about what is your go-to backing, and we'd like you to give our um, to give your opinion, or if you have one, there is an other option there, so you don't have to choose. But if you could choose one or the other, um, we'll take a peek at that and see how it goes. <coughs> <laughs> so we're seeing those come in right now, and um, it's looking like, um, I don't want to sway your decisions here, um, so we're going to reveal that very quickly here. I'll give it a couple more seconds here, and um, we'll let you know what we find out. Okay, here we go. So here are the results of that poll that you took. Thank you very much. Um, so a resounding 58% of you chose basic cutaway. And that's actually um, great to see that that's your go-to backing because cutaway should be in your arsenal when it comes to embroidery. Um, your, your basic tearaway, you want to keep in mind that a t every tearaway that's out there essentially is a washaway tearaway just because of the way it's made up. Um, so even though a design may look good as it leaves your shop, once it's, um, if it's a flimsy um, material or not stable, that design might not look so good after it's being washed. So it doesn't mean you're not using the right thing. You just want to make sure that you consider um, your cut. Um, actually, what I should say is you want to make sure that you're not using a tear away for the ease of tearing it away. Um, thank you again for taking the, that poll for us. Want to share your results? The other percentages? Um, oh, yep. Actually, I can share the other um, percentages as well. So 15% of you chose basic tearaway. 11% chose the Weblon no-show, and that's not surprising um, there as well, because that's what you're going to use on your performance wear. We'll talk about that a little more. And 10% of you um, either chose or, or either saying that you don't particularly have a go-to um, or maybe it's a different type of a, a stabilizer. And that's okay because every um, shop, you know, some people have specialized things that they do and they simply don't use your basic um, types of stabilizers. Um, so now we're going to move along and talk about the elements of a design and how that affects the choice of your stabilizer. Um, so very often you might hear, you know, what type of design you have. And what, what we're asking you is, is it a heavy design or is it a light design? And the way that you can tell the difference between that is the types of stitches that are in the design. On the left-hand side, this um, I should point out that both of these designs have around 10,000 stitches, so that's a good amount of stitches. Um, however, the one on the left is probably about 8 inches by 6 inches. 
The design on the right is about maybe one and a half inches tall by two and a half inches wide. So you're talking about 10,000 stitches in totally different sizes when it comes to the design. So the design on the right of the pumpkin is mostly fill. You've got some satin stitches there. Um, so it's a very heavy design. So it needs a lot more stabilizing when it comes down to choosing it. The design on the light, I'm um, sorry, the design on the left is an open area type design. And those are running stitches um, with no fill stitches. So in a sense, um, this design doesn't need as much stabilizing as the other design. Um, some questions have come in, but I, I can't help but notice but that they're going to be covered when you get to that section, so we're going to not um, interrupt with questions at this point. Okay, um, so stick-on did come on. So a stick-on backing is a stabilizer that has some adhesive on it, and it usually has a release paper. Once you take that paper off, you have this nice um, adhesive on the back side, and, you know, what do you do when that gums up? What do you do, you know, how do you use that to embroider on the hem of a sleeve? Um, or any type of garment or part of a garment that you can't hoop. Um, so here's some examples of the types of garments that you might want to use this type of a backing for. Think of the horse, uh, the harness for the horse or the cuff of a collar, I'm um, sorry, the cuff of a shirt or the collar of a shirt. Um, or maybe you want to embroider on the hem of a sock. You can also think about embroidering on the edge of anything. So maybe you wanted to or, um, embroider on the top edge of the bag or maybe the bottom edge of the jacket that you see there. And using this type of a stabilizer is going to allow you to do that. We have a video coming up. Um, and I think, um, I think it's a very interesting um, process in how you use this in a particular way to get on the edge of the shirts. And... Um, Let's take a look at the next slide, and we're just going to talk about um, what, how do you, or what happens when your needle gums up. Because there is an adhesive on the stabilizer, it can happen from time to time. Um, and the picture that you see on the left side is a picture of that gum kind of on the needle. And when I was preparing for this webinar, I actually had a really hard time trying to get a needle um, to gum up on this type of a stabilizer. So it's important for you to know that um, the quality of the product that you're purchasing is super important. So be careful when you go into the online giants or maybe you're buying something secondhand. Um, you don't want to do that with this type of a product. You want to make sure, number one, that it's a quality product, but you also want to make sure that it's a fresh product. Um, high heat, high humidity can actually break down the adhesive that's on this product. And once that happens, that's when you can start gumming up your needles. Um, so you just want to make sure that you're using a fresh product. Um, notice that, um, well, the, the gum is on this needle. So sometimes it can happen from time to time, no matter what you do. And it could depend on what you're embroidering on. To make this happen, I actually put some felt on the stick on back and embroidered it so that I could get the, the hairs from the felt to stick there, at least to have a picture. Um, so it can happen from time to time, and if it does, um, you can just simply keep an eye on it and pick it off as you see it build up. Um, do make sure that you turn your machine off before you do that. We don't want you um, embroidering your finger. Um, there's also non-stick type needles that are out there, much like the uh, Teflon pans that you might use, and your eggs don't stick to it. This is a very similar um, type metal so that it doesn't stick. Um, and I've actually even gone so far as to take a little bit of the white machine oil, put it on my fingers, and just rub it on the needle. So it just gives a little bit of a coating on there. You don't want to do too much of that um, because you want to make sure that you're not getting it. Um, you don't want to transfer that oil onto your garment. So if it's a delicate fabric, you might want to might not want to try that one. Um, and notice we have on the right, uh, kind of in the middle there, we have a green hoop. That has the easy stick on um, backing hooped with the sticky side up. We took the paper off, and that's actually the edge of the cuff, um, the edge of a short sleeve shirt. So by having all that adhesive, you're able to stick that um, edge of that shirt right there, and it's nice and flat. You can put that in your machine, and you can embroider on it. Um, coming up next, we've got a, a video. Um, on how to 
use the stick on backing to embroider on the edge of anything, pretty much. Um, so here we have the edge of a shirt on the back side. We've taken the release paper off of that stabilizer, sticky side up. We're going to line it up nice and straight on the backing. We're going to press it on. It's a pressure sensitive adhesive, so you want to press it on kind of nice and firm. And then don't throw away that release paper. We're going to put it back on the exposed edge. So now we're covering that stickiness so that we can um, hoop it and it's not going to stick to the hoop. And get a little excess paper there, so we're just going to tear it off. You could use a piece, uh, pair of scissors to do that. That would be fine. Um, and just think of all the fun things you could actually do and embroider on the edge of a garment. Because um, now you have a nice place um, where you can hoop it normally. And, but we want to get where we're going to embroider. We want to put that in the center of the hoop. The edge of the garment is held nice and firm, nice and um, still. It's not going to move while it's embroidered, so we're hooping it, and it's ready to go to the machine. We have a small design here, not too big. Um, this is the smallest round hoop. Um, embroidered it. Now it's ready to be unhooped, and it's a tearaway. Easy tear stick on is a tearaway, so you're just going to tear away all the excess stabilizer. Um, and because it's a small design, we didn't need a lot of stabilizer to help it out, and it's ready to be worn. Nancy, I'm going to interrupt here for just a second. A question, should stick-on stabilizer be used as additional backing when doing repair stitches that have already perforated the hooped backing? I'm not sure if I understand the question 100%, but my take upon that is maybe you're trying to fix something um, that uh, maybe you're trying to remove the stitches. Maybe you're trying to embroider over stitches. Um, stick on backing is certainly going to help hold it in place. And it is very possible that you might be able to embroider on top of it. Um, so hopefully that answered your question. Another question is stick on backing more stable for edges than basic cutaway. Um, when it comes to the edges, um, maybe if you're doing an applique magic, um, that's going to keep your fabric from fraying. Um, but just remember, you want to make sure you're using a cutaway. Um, the t easy tear stick on is a tearaway. Um, so I only used a very small design that's embroidered on the back of the shirt. That, that tree that you see there is literally about a one inch by one inch, um, small lettering. So it's on a t-shirt. I used the tear stick. Um, the easy tear stick on stabilizer because I felt like that shirt was heavy enough to be able to support the design. Um, you don't want to replace tear, tear away with a, um, you don't want to replace cutaway with a tear away unless the design and the fabric can support it. How would you imagine these, um, the stick on works with magnetic hoops? Um, actually, I don't think that's going to work at all because magnetic hoops are great. I've used them and they're super easy to use when it comes to whether you're using your tear, your basic tear away, your basic cut away, holds it nice in place. When it comes to the tear stick away, I'm sorry, the easy tear stick on, you actually have to line it up. You need to press it on and you're not going to be able to do that, I don't think, with the um, magnetic hoops. Um, so just to be clear, when it comes to easy tear, um, easy tear stick on, it's really more of a problem solver as opposed to a substitution. Um, we've got a couple of people writing in that you actually can use the um, tear stick on with the magnetic hoops. Maybe they can sh share that information, and we'll um, we'll get that out to the other people as well. Um, but it's this is not your basic tear um, stabilizer. It, it's used for particulars. Um, one of the other things that it's used for is there, there are fast frames that are out there. Those are those big window type frames where you stick, stick this backing onto it and you have this huge area um, to embroider on. Um, if you think about doing 20 dog collars, um, you could hoop on a, you know, maybe an 18 inch by 18 inch hoop and maybe you could put those 10 collars on top of that stick on and you line up your machine and you embroider on the collars, or maybe it's the horse halter or the horse um, um, collars and things like that. <clears throat> so 
Think about it as a special case stabilizer for special things and problem solving. Um, we are going to move on to the next one, which is the polyester polos that are out there, or otherwise known as the performance wear materials. Uh, we did get a lot of questions on this one, so we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. And um, because they do present the biggest challenge, they are probably the most popular garment that's out there. Um, I've been working recently with somebody who's actually working on the caps, and those are a challenge in and of themselves. But um, how heavy of a logo can it be? Can it be over 10,000? How do we get it to not potato chip or curl? Um, and how do we prevent it from feeling too heavy? Um, so one of our um, customers sent this particular design in, and I work very closely with the customer, with the digitizer, um, in order to fix this design so it didn't look like this. Um, and it look like, um, looks like it should. Um, when it comes to testing designs, and I find this especially true on the lightweight wovens, um, it could be your t-shirts, it could be your performance wear, um, you always want to test your designs out on a light fabric before you start a big project. And part of that testing should be putting that garment through the laundry. So maybe you don't want to put the finished garment that you're going to be handing to the customer through the laundry, but you want to make sure that you order an extra shirt um, or have that fabric, like fabric, on hand. Because designs can actually look great as soon as you embroider on the garment, you present it to your customer, they love it, and then they put it in the washer, and then they put it in the dryer. And then you go to visit them, and you look at it, and you say, ooh, that doesn't look so good. Um, and they don't even know that it doesn't look too bad, um, or it looks really bad. So it's important that you wash and dry a finished product just to make sure that it looks good. Because word of mouth or repeat business is very important. And that is the example of your potato chip? That is the example of a potato chip. Um, certainly want to keep the potato chips for your sandwiches, not for your embroidery. Um, so, you know, as much as this is a uh, webinar about backing and stabilizer, choosing the correct ones, when it comes to pretty much any designs, but especially for these thinner, you know, whether it's a t-shirt, um, whether it's the performance wear or a lightweight um, woven dress shirt, digitizing is super important, and we're going to get into the details or some basics when it comes to the digitizing for performance wear. Um, you want to make sure that you use underlay so it will stabilize the fill areas. You want to consider the push and the pull of the fabric when you're digitizing because, um, especially with these round or oval designs, and for the larger designs like this one, which is about three inches, you want to digitize from the center out and from the bottom up, and that's very similar to the digitizing for caps, and what it does is it helps um, uh, lay the fabric nicely in the design, and last but not least, you really want to avoid high stitch count designs when it comes to this fabric. This particular design started out over 10,000 stitches, and we got it down below 10,000 stitches once all was said and done. To get more information about performance wear in particular, we have a past webinar that we've done. It's right here. Um, Think light, embroidering on super stretchy performance fabrics. Be sure to check that out on our YouTube page, and um, you're going to get a little more information, or a lot more information from that. And we'll just continue on a little bit about the digitizing process. Um, this was the design or the images that were sent by the customer themselves, so we talked about properly digitizing the design. And you want to um, consider if it's a very large stitch count logo, you might want to consider creating a patch instead. Um, Madeira's multifunctional frame system or the badge film, essentially creating a badge on plastic and um, adhering it to the garment is an option when it comes to the really large designs. Uh, but we want to help you get to the point where it looks like the next slide, um, which is here. So here we have the final design, and now we're going to talk specifically about <coughs> the stabilizers when it comes to this design. So I worked with the digitizer. He got it to where it should be. However, when I embroidered the design out, the same design on the left with just a single piece of the Easy Weblon No-Show stabilizer, 
Um, and after it was laundered, that's what it looked like. So not quite potato chippy, but certainly not nice and flat. By adding, by simply adding an additional layer of the Easy Webland No Show and a single piece of the Easy Tear Lightweight, one ounce, this is what the same product, or same design on the same garment um, looked like after it was washed. Um, I know that probably a lot of you or some of you are out there are saying, could you float that Easy Tear Lightweight underneath um, as opposed to hooping it? Absolutely, you can do that. I personally prefer to hoop it along with the um, Weblon no-show and the garment. I think by hooping and having that um, Easy Tear Lightweight on the bottom, tearaway stabilizers tend to hoop a little easier than cutaway stabilizers, so putting it on the bottom, hooping it, um, I think you're going to find it runs well. But absolutely, you can float that one and a half ounce or that one ounce tearaway on the bottom. Um, and somebody asked, can you use the one and a half ounce? Absolutely. Um, I tend to say less is more. I've got great results here with the one ounce. Um, perfect. If you find that it works okay with the one and a half ounce, then by all means, go right ahead and switch over to that. Um, so remember, properly digitized designs are going to create a great outcome. Um, but when it comes to the performance wear, the two pieces of Weblon No Show or the one and the one piece of Easy Tear Lightweight is my magic recipe, um, and I think it works really well. Nancy, is there any um, concern about the Weblon shrinking? No, it does not shrink. You are, uh, the Easy Weblon No Show one one and a half ounce. Um, does not shrink. I see a question up there. You're talking about the one and a half ounce or the 1.65 ounce. Uh, the 1.65 ounce that we carry is actually a fusible, and that extra 0.15 ounces is actually the adhesive that is put on the same stabilizer. Um, so either one will work well. Um, I prefer not to use the stabilizer when it comes to um, using it as a true backing. Would you ever use a topping on something like this? Um, for this particular type of a design, um, the thing that would benefit if you used a topping would be um, the outer edges of that rat, um, sorry, the red satin outline there. Um, you can actually gain a little bit of clarity by using a topping because it kind of holds it up a little bit. Um, if you were embroidering those small green letters directly onto the garment, I would definitely use a topping um, for pretty much any fabric. Um, because it's going to give you a little more clarity. Another question here, how close would you trim uh, the wet line to the design? Um, when I trim a cutaway backing, I try to get as close as I can to it, and I essentially I hold the backing, and I make sure that I can see the garment as I'm cutting, because I don't want to nick the garment, um, and I just trim as close as I can get to, to the scissors. Um, because you really don't need that excess um, stabilizer on the edge, so you don't need I mean, if I had to guess, I'd say, you know, a quarter to an eighth of an inch next to it. And you just want to be careful you don't get too close and start nicking the fabric. Um, I'd rather see a little leftover stabilizer than a hole in the garment. Another question that just came in, um, why Weblon instead of the performance backing, the woven performance backing? Um, that's a great question, and to, and we're, I'm actually going to show that on the, um, the dress shirts coming up. And to be honest, they're interchangeable. For the most part, Easy Weblon No Show um, and the Easy Cut Performance, they perform very similar. I found a little bit more marked, in, uh, a small marked improvement when it came to um, the dress shirts to use the Easy Cut Performance. Um, but in fact, you can use either one. One uh, last question about this picture is the lightweight um, tearaway sandwich between the Weblon No Show, or is there any particular order to the way you put it on there? Yeah, I mean, I tend to put the lightweight tearaway on the very bottom so that I can simply tear it away, and then when I'm ready to um, cut the Weblon No Show away, it's out of my way. Um, there should, for a design like this, it's completely sandwiched with all the stitches there, so you're not going to have that. Um, tear away next to the skin so you're not going to feel it. Um, for a design where maybe they're going to feel that tear away next to their skin because maybe there's some open areas there, um, maybe you want to sandwich it and put it in between. But either way, it's going to work well. Um, 
but I tend to put it on the bottom myself. And like I said, um, a lot of people like to float a piece underneath, and what that essentially means is, um, so instead of hooping that lightweight tear away, you leave it off for now, you hoop the shirt with the two pieces of the Easy Weblon No-Show, you put it on your machine, and you slide that tear away in between um, the hoop and the throw plate. Uh, where it's going to embroider. And once it starts embroider, it kind of holds it in place. Um, but like I said before, I like to hoop it. I prefer to hoop it. Um, I don't mind floating the topping on top. Um, usually that works pretty well. Which one is softer against the skin? Um, they're both pretty equally. Um, I, the Weblon has, I think, a little bit more of a silky feel to it. Um, the Easy Cut Performance has kind of a stiff feel to it until it's washed. Once it's washed, um, any um, binder or starch that's in it, and that's what helps you hoop it, um, goes away. So they're both very soft against the skin. A uh, question that came in earlier, but now is the is the right time to answer it. If you're using two pieces of no-show, um, should you rotate them? And if yes, is it 45 or 90 degrees? Um, that's actually a really good question. Again, uh, when it comes to Weblin no-show, they are a non-directional, um, non-woven stabilizer. So um, a lot of people do that. They do it with basic cutaway. They do it with basic tearaway. And you're talking about, you know, you put one one piece down and you put the other one kind of at 45 degrees. Um, and when it comes to non-woven stabilizers, you're really not gaining a lot of stability by alternating how they're low. Their lane. Um, however, when it comes to a woven stabilizer like our Easy Cut Performance, um, those actually gain um, some stabilizing effects when you put them at a 45 degree. Um, so it doesn't hurt to alternate them and put them at a 45 degree if you're using two pieces, um, but you're not going to gain any stability per se because it's a non woven. And someone wrote in, why not just use three pieces of Weblon? Um, you're getting a little bit heavy when it comes to stabilizer, and it's really not needed. Uh, the Easy Tear Lightweight, uh, whether it's the one ounce or the one and a half ounce, is actually doing two things. It is helping you hoop it without stretching the fabric too much. Um, so as you hoop anything, we all know that you're really not supposed to tug it. You're supposed to be able to hoop it in a way that once you push that top hoop in, it's perfect. If you're tugging at the material here and then, you're taking the chance that you're stretching the fabric, and that in and of itself can cause puckering. Um, and that tearaway just gives it a little bit extra um, stiffness, um, even during the laundering process. So I don't think it's necessary to use three pieces of Weblon. I think you might be adding... Um, a little bit of um, extra bulk to the design, um, especially when it comes to a design like this. Um, here's, a, here's an opportunity that you can't you can't miss. Um, someone is asking if a topping is used, what do you recommend? Um, so our Easy Aqua Supreme topping is uh, works beautifully. It is water soluble. It's but uh, it's a 20 mil product and. On a design especially like this, you're just going to perforate it away. There's not going to be any leftover um, topping there. But if, say, there was no blue um, stitching there and there was just the outline with the yellow and the green, um, it comes up very easily uh, by adding some steam and um, things like that. Um, hooping in and of itself it is a challenge for any embroiderer that's new, brand new. Um, the trick is getting the bottom hoop set in such a way that you're not um, putting too much pressure on the, the fabric um, as you're hooping. Because like I said, you're really supposed to be able to just push that hoop in and you're going to have that kind of tambourine look or feel to the garment. You're going to run your finger across it. It's not supposed to move. Um, when it comes to performance wear, it's a bit of an art to figure that out. Um, but adjusting your bottom hoop to make sure it's not too tight. Um, you're almost better off having it a little bit looser um, than you are having it too tight um, because you don't you just don't want to have to pull on that fabric. And you're certainly not going to if you can um, if it's too tight. Um, but 
don't make it too loose because you certainly don't want it to fall off as you're embroidering. I have had that happen to me and it's not pretty. Um, here's a question that I've not heard of before. Can you use a tear away as a topping? Um, it's not recommended that you would use a tear away for a topping. Um, so, you know, if, if you say if you were using a topping on this particular design, you would have backing in between every little letter that you see. So even in the larger yellow letters, if you look at the RV up inside that R, you're going to have white backing up there. So no, you don't want to use backing for a topping. Um, there's specific water soluble toppings out there like Easy Aqua Supreme, um, and they're made specifically to be used as a topping. Um, so going back to the digitizing just a little bit, um, Jesse Elliott from, um, Alice help me out here, uh, Ignition, Ignition Drawing. drawing. <laughs> so Jesse Elliott from Ignition Drawing helped us out to give us some more basic tips for digitizing. And we talked about the underlay. Can uh, you explain what that is? There was a question that I, I should have asked sooner. Okay. Somebody asking what underlay is. Underlay is, is what it sounds like, it's actually the layers of stitches that are underneath the fill or underneath your satin stitches. Um, running stitches are probably the only stitches that don't have an underlay, um, but most times you want to make sure that you have underlay. And underlay is the foundation of a design, such as the one that we were looking at. You know, it's about a three inch oval design. Um, if you simply just did a fill stitch on that fabric without this underlay, um, you'd have a disaster on your hand. So Jesse put together um, these basic tips for us for to share with you, and very often you'll have a single layer of underlay under your fill. When it comes to the performance wear t-shirts um, or just the light flimsy um, garments that are out there, adding an extra layer of underlay at a different angle um, creates this perfect underlay for the fill stitch to go on, and you're not going to get the potatoes potato chip effect. Um, and he goes on to recommend um, angles such as 105 degrees for one, 120 degrees for another, which seems like, well, why would you do that? Those are kind of off numbers. Why wouldn't you use the 45 to 90 um, or 0, 180? Um, the whole um, kind of idea here is you want to go at opposite angles of what a natural, fa uh, natural fabric angles are. So you're not putting them in the same angles that a shirt um, might be. And then it's not fighting it against each other. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Again, we have that Think Light webinar that I think that you'll find very helpful um, for this part of it. And on the next slide, um, it just goes on to talk about for those large designs, stitching from the center out is very helpful. It helps keep the, uh, the stretch to a minimum. It avoids the push and pull of the garment. You don't want to sandwich, you know, if you're going from one side to the other, you're going to be pushing the fabric along. Um, and it's really only necessary for those real large fill areas. Uh, for example, three inches or larger um, kind of makes sense. So hopefully that's helpful there. Thank you, um, Jesse Elliott. I just want to throw out there a question came in about the availability of the webinar. Um, we did announce at the beginning, and, and we'll just repeat it now for those who might be called away. Um, we are recording the webinar, so you'll be able to see it, hear it uh, at your convenience. And we're also creating a printable version, so all the slides can be printed. And if anyone is interested in any more detail about any of the products mentioned, there are handouts for that. And you will receive, everyone that has registered, uh, for the webinar, we'll receive um, an email this afternoon with links to all of those things. Sorry, Nancy. Thank you, Alice. Um, so our last uh, thing that we talk about are dress shirts because you can kind of have similar issues when it comes to um, embroidering on even you know simple dress shirts. <coughs> Do you use the two pieces, the, she uh, the three sheets of the topper, and is Weblon No Shirt great for these? And the answer is actually a combination of the above. Um, so this customer here sent in these, uh, this design on these types of garments. They're just various um, lightweight woven dress shirts and the issues that they were having. And it really does boil down to that digitizing. So quality digitizing is very important. 
Um, you can use either the EasyCut forms or the EasyWeb on no-show stabilizers, um, but you can also add that lightweight tearaway, just like we did with the performance wear. However, I really want to point out the, um, the need to use quality garments when it comes to dress shirts, because when I was doing the testing for this, um, and you're going to see the final results in a slide, uh, we're just a slide away from that, but what I found was the shirt that I originally started doing the testing with, it seemed like no matter what I did, and I think I embroidered um, Madeira's logo about 20 times on this one particular shirt, um, playing around with different designs, playing around with different um, stabilizing combinations. And, and I actually came to the conclusion that some garments um, just simply don't work well when it comes to embroidery. And it just happened to be, it wasn't a uh, brand name shirt, um, a name that I hadn't heard of, and I think just the makeup of the shirt really didn't work well. Um, so maybe your experience in that, and maybe um, sometimes you want to think, you know, if you're cutting pennies in one way, you know, you're really hurting yourself on the other side. So make sure you use quality garments, quality blanks, um, and if one doesn't work, try a different one. A question came in about digitizing, and um, at this point, some of you are probably kind of rolling your eyes thinking digitizing. Uh, and I have to point out that we have um, in our audience a lot of different ranges of abilities. So um, we, we kind of wrestled with the idea of whether to even include digitizing. But Nancy's point was that we can talk till, from today till next week about um, backing and stabilizers, but if the digitizing is not correct, it is not going to work. One of the questions that just came in involves digitizing for performance wear. And if this um, customer has a design digitized for performance wear, which is mostly polyester or poly blend shirt, can he then turn um, to something like a 100% cotton t-shirt and use the same digitizing on that design for that t-shirt? Um, and of course the answer is yes and no, uh, because it really comes down to the quality of the digitizing. Um, if you have a digitizer, if you're doing your own digitizing, then you need to um, be digitizing for specific fabrics um, based on their characteristics. If you're using a digitizer, um, a good quality digitizer is going to offer or allow you to request more than one design. Um, so say you have one logo for one company and they want some of them put on their dress shirt, they want others put on a performance polo, um, and then maybe they want to put it on a nylon jacket. You should be able to tell that digitizer, I have three garments, three types of fabric that I'm going to put this on. Um, either we can do one design that's kind of in the middle and that will work for all three, or could you supply me with um, multiple designs? The other one is going to be for your caps. So if you're embroidering that same logo on a cap, it has to be digitized differently. Um, so it should go from the center out, bottom up when it comes to a cap. Um, and there's other, I'm sorry, there's other elements as well that you have to take into account. Um, but a good digitizer, quality digitizer is going to say, yes, absolutely, I can do that. And, you know, it took, and it's going to be up to them to, you know, decide whether they're going to charge you for that, offer it at no charge or minimal charge at the most. But super important to make sure that the digitizing is correct for all your different garments and all your different fabrics. Nancy, um, would ironing or steaming help with the puckering on a garment? It sure will. And actually, you know, if, say, if somebody where these designs really don't look horrible to me, um, there's a little bit of puckering here or there, but not bad. And, you know, your end customer might be really good about it, and they may take it to the iron and, you know, after they wash it, and they're going to iron it out, and they're going to make it look a little better. Um, they might not even know that they shouldn't have to do that, um, but they do do it. Um, others, um, like the RV, um, the other one that we talked about, the big um, oval one, they don't even know. I mean, some people just don't even know that they should use an iron to make it look a little better. So absolutely, you can do it. Um, but should somebody have to do that on a performance polo, or should they have to do that on a dress shirt that's supposed to be wrinkle-free? Um, the last thing that they want to do is pull out an iron to make the logo look good. 
And then, you know, like I said earlier, repeat business, word of mouth is super important in this industry. Um, so you want to make sure it looks good um, after the, after your customer has put it through a laundering cycle. Um, so we took the Madeira logo and had it digitized. Um, this was actually, I knew it was a design. It was newly digitized. I knew it was done well. Uh, but just like with the performance wear, uh, my special uh, recipe when it comes to stabilizers, I did switch over from the easy web on no show to the easy cut performance for this um, dress shirt. Could have used either one, I think, and the, the results would have been the same, but adding that piece of easy tear lightweight to the right side um, versus the single piece of easy cut performance stabilizer on the left you can see the design simply did not hold up well once it was uh, laundered. Um, and when I do the laundry test, I throw it in with a normal um, launder cycle, uh, washing cycle, I should say, and I put it in the average drying cycle, which is typically kind of high, because um, I want to give it the best, re uh, the best test that I can. Um, so the reason why you're seeing the logo look really nice on the right-hand side is it didn't squish up at all. Um, it's, it's laying nice and flat, um, rayon thread was used here, and um, it just looks so much better on the right hand side. Nancy, a, a question that came in earlier, um, can you use a tear away on a beanie? Are there any stitch restrictions to that? Um, yes, absolutely. You can use a tear away on a beanie, and most likely you're going to want to use a tear away on a beanie because you want it to go away. Um, and we're talking about a beanie cap, um, nice knit cap that kind of folds up, and you're going to embroider on the piece that folds up um, logo or, you know, whatever type of design you want. So, yeah, you're, you're probably going to want that design to, I'm sorry, you're going to want that stabilizer to disappear. Um, your challenge is making sure that the design is digitized in such a way that it's going to hold up uh, while it's being worn. You know, it's going to go through the wash and dry. Um, so again, you want to make sure that, that design is um, done well and it's going to be able to hold up. A question came in about the, the longevity of stick-on. How long can you keep it um, to keep it fresh? Right. And, you know, there's no exact answer for that, but keeping it away from humidity, keeping it away from heat, um, so keep it out of the sun. Um, I would even advise so far as to, you know, keep it in a Ziploc bag if you have one big enough to throw it in um, or a container that you can seal and just keeping it away from the elements um, for a while. Um, but certainly, you know, if you have it for six months to a year, you're just taking, you're taking the chance that it could break down and it may work okay and it might just gum your needles up a little bit. You just have to take a little extra care to pick it off as it builds up, maybe use that um, nonstick needle that's out there um, or maybe a little oil on it uh, but it can last quite some time um, someone's asking the same thing about the easy aqua topping same exact thing that one you definitely want to keep it in a um, airtight container because you don't want any humidity getting to that um, because it is a water soluble it's no problem that question <laughs> came in from arizona so. <laughs> from arizona no, so you have dry heat uh, but you also don't want it to dry out. It gets a little crispy when it dries out. So, again, keep it in the um, in a Ziploc bag or a Tupperware um, container, just something that keeps it away from the elements, and it'll stay nice and fresh for you. Would you want to touch at all on um, when you're embroidering on silk or poly satin, if you have to use um, satin stitches on that, what kind of backing you'd use? Well, it's a lightweight, unstable fabric, so I definitely try to use a cutaway. So if you're not going to see the back side of that in any way, shape, or form, a nice, light cutaway um, stabilizer would work good. Um, but consider your designs when you're embroidering on fabrics um, such as that. You know, remember that light design we saw with the flowers, open area, just a bunch of um, running stitches for the most part. Um, you want to stick to that kind of a design when it comes to that fabric. Um, putting a logo on satin, um, like even at the Madeira logo here, might be a little heavy for it. The pictures that everybody's seeing now, someone commented that it looks like a knit, but this was the shirt I think that you were referring to that just was fighting back and not 
No, this was actually the good, sh this was the Oxford dress shirt. So it's actually, a, um, it's still a lightweight fabric. So I use the cutaway um, the stabilizer, woven. but it's, n it's definitely a woven, um, but it's an Oxford taken up very, uh, the image was taken close uh, with a very good camera. Um, so I can see how you might think it looks like it's um, a knit, but it's actually a woven uh, dress shirt with no stretch to it. Um, but yeah, um, photography is not a very good friend of embroidery. It does not show it nearly as well as seeing it in um, person. Um, but thanks for asking that question. Um, another, uh, this is a thread question. Does it make a difference whether it's rayon or polyester? Um, rayon is my choice of thread for pretty much all embroidery, unless I'm trying to throw some, you know, shiny metallics or matte finished, um, like our frosted matte. I like rayon because number one, it's a natural fiber, so the colors are more in depth and, and prettier to me. I think they produce a nicer embroidery. But on the other side, it is a softer thread to embroider with and it doesn't bite uh, with the material. So polyester is just a little bit tougher, I, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, and it might fight with the thread. So when it comes to performance, where it's such a flimsy, lightweight material, a rayon is going to lay flatter on that material versus a polyester. Um, polyester definitely has its place in the embroidery industry um, because it can withstand, um, you know, it's great for uniforms and um, things that are subjected to harsh laundering and maybe bleach down the, down the road. Um, a timely question about a graduation sash where, unfortunately, um, tearaway uh, stabilizer is required. Any thoughts on how to make that happen? Um, make sure the digitizing is done well enough so that it can kind of support itself. Um, absolutely, you don't want to see any stabilizer left on the back side. You don't want to use a cut wash away because you don't want to put water on it. Um, so a nice, thin, crisp tearaway um, can do well with well digitizing. And um, another a person is looking at this picture and asking if you could repeat the order in which you put the two pieces of performance and the one piece of um, lightweight. Sure, absolutely. What's, what's um, against the fabric and what's against the skin. You got it. Um, I always put the uh, two pieces of easy cut performance on uh, next to the garment, and I put the easy tear lightweight uh, stabilizer on the very bottom. I like the stabilizer on the bottom. Um, I'm sorry, I like the tearaway stabilizer on the bottom because it helps you hoop. Uh, and what I mean by that is I find I have to hoop something less times if I'm putting that tearaway on the bottom because just the stiffness of the tearaway helps grip the hoop and the fabric at the same time. And, you know, you don't have um, your fabric kind of floating in there and you have to pull it apart and hoop it again. Um, so I, and the other reason why I like to put the tearaway on the bottom is because I can tear the majority of it away and then it's out of my way and I'm ready to um, trim the easy cut performance stabilizer. Okay, uh, I want to also remind people that we are collecting all of the questions that you're submitting today. And so if we weren't able to answer them in real time, they will be available as well. Um, just want to go through a little bit more um, for you if you'll stay with us for a few more minutes. Um, I'd like to summarize now with one response that came into us very early on. Um, this came from Carmen Bell, and I think it kind of sums up where, uh, where people are when they're just starting out. But she wrote in um, as her question, as a new member of the embroidery family, I have found that the backing that is used will save the project. I have learned through trial and lots of errors that the quality of your stabilizer does matter. I initially purchased my stabilizer from the online giant, and I purchased the industrial strength size of everything. That was a mistake. The tear away wouldn't, the wash away didn't, and the stick on is still on it resembling chewing gum. I ripped so many stitches that now those industrial strength size stabilizers are little more than doorstops quality, no matter the cost, yields the best results. Um, thank you, Carmen, for sharing that with us. And uh, Nancy, I wanted to thank you for all of the information that you shared today. 
Uh, what you see before you now is a list of those customers who did submit uh, questions that we tried to answer. Uh, we will, again, we will be collecting all of the questions that were submitted today. Nancy will review all of them and supply answers, and we will be sending you a link to get to the Q&A so that, again, if we weren't able to answer your question today, you will have it by Friday the latest. Um, finally, we'd like to share a special with you to thank you for sticking with us for this hour. Um, any order that you place online in the next couple of weeks, um, if you include any um, product from our easy bagging and topping line, you will receive 10% off of the complete order. Um, again, everyone is registered. You can expect, um, regardless of your time, time zone, uh, later today you will receive an email. We'll be thanking you for your attendance at the webinar. We will be supplying a link to the recorded webinar, to a printable version, to the special, uh, the special, and to the handouts that are available that go into more details about our products. And then possibly late tomorrow or certainly by Friday, you will receive a second email that will give you a link to all the questions and answers. We want to thank you for the time that you gave us today, and we, we certainly hope that, um, that we helped. Please don't hesitate to call and speak with someone in our customer sales and support department. Um, Nancy's also available. Um, if, the, um, if the challenge needs to be escalated to her, she can, um, she can help as well. Thank you all very much, and we hope to see you again next quarter here for our next webinar. Nancy, thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, everybody.